Exploring Hobbies. My name is Randy Nunez and the hobby we'll be talking about today is sailing. And here to talk to us about sailing is our guest Martin Wolferts. Welcome to the show Martin. Thanks for having me. So how did you get started in sailing? I started uh, sort of in my pre-teens. friend of mine who happened to be a neighbor as well had a, had a 470 which is a 4 meter 70 long boat, sort of a racing dinghy that, that he raced in a sort of junior class in, on one of, the, one of the lakes close to where I grew up in Cologne in Germany. And I got interested in that. Anyway, when I was much younger, I always was interested by, uh, in, in sort of naval life. Uh, so you read all these Treasure Island kind of things. Uh, so I always was, was interested in, in water, water sports, th these things. And when, when this opportunity came along, um, I, I started sailing with him as the, as the force woman in, uh, in, in, in his boat. Um, that became more and more competitive. We raced for about three seasons, if I recall correctly. And then he moved, he moved, moved away and I started school and it, it was it, it sort of a died down a little bit. Um, and then um, actually much later, um, uh, I thought I wanted to go back to that, but at that time I was already too old and too, uh, too cranky to uh, do dinghy racing. So I started um, racing with uh, a couple of friends that had a boat at the DYC and started, started, started racing with them on the CNC 29, which is a really nice keel boat, very, very stable, but still fast enough, competitive enough. Um, and since then, I've been sailing all along, more or less. So you mentioned a couple of different sailboats and some competitive things in there. Are there different types of sailing yeah. that you could talk about? Yeah, that actually, there's, there's the, the, the type of boat most people really start with is um, a dinghy, i.e. sort of a, a boat that, that usually has a two, three person crew. Um, usually very unstable, so you need to be on your tippy toes in order to sail it the right way, uh, to keep it the right side up in the water. Um, the good thing about these kinds of boats is they are actually very um, manageable in terms of cost and in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, maintenance and, and upkeep that, that they need. You, can, you don't need um, uh, a marina, a slip or anything like that. You just launch them, sail, relatively easy, easy to manage. But they require quite some athleticism if you, if you, want, to, if you want to sail them fast. Um, then the other major type of boat is really keel boats, boats that uh, uh, mono hulls, one hull that have a, a ballast keel underneath that usually, under most of all circumstances, really prevents it from tipping over in, in, in wind gusts or any, anything like that. Um, what I have become more and more interested in lately is actually multi-hull boats. Um, boats that um, have more than one, one hull, multi-hull, trimorans or catamarans. Um, the reason for that is that um, they are actually really fast. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to sail a, sail a multi-hull fast than a monohull. Um, they have some very interesting characteristics in terms of um, the, their behavior on the water that makes them kind of interesting to sail. Um, is so that because they have fewer touch points on the water? Uh, there, there are several sort of physical physical reasons for that. The the um, a, a monohull is more or less um, in most circumstances limited in speed by its length because it's uh, it's a displacement uh, type of situation. That, that means sort of the the um, the maximum possible speed is proportional to the length. The longer, the faster it can get. That's why you see these 70 foot uh, SCs or, um, that, that are racing well ahead of the crowd in a Mackinac race. Um, but with, um, there is a situation where a sailboat starts planing, i.e. sort of it lifts itself depending on the speed, it lifts itself out of, out of the wave and then is no longer depending on its length in terms of maximum speed. 
to get a keelboard there, you have to have the right conditions. You have to have the right form form of the hull, and you have to have, have the right conditions. Usually, that only happens when uh, you have the wind really well from above. For multi hulls, you don't really have that situation. They are sort of in planing mode all the time. So even with very very limited wind they more or less take off rather quickly, hmm. which is one of the things that makes them both interesting and challenging because they are um, significantly more um, volatile in terms of their behavior than keelboats are. Um, but that makes them interesting, so uh, I, I started to get interested in that. So you talked about different kinds of equipment. Do people sail for pleasure or for uh, racing or combination or how, how do people, how can you break it up for me in terms of you got the casual user all the way up to the highly competitive <laughs> sponsored by corporations. Right. M most people really, uh, most people sail for pleasure. Although when two sailboats are together, somehow there's always a race. But uh, most people really sail for pleasure. Um, if you look at your, uh, at your sort of your stereotypical marina here at the Great Lakes, I, I would say about 70-80% of the boats that you see are mere pleasure boats, sailboats that is. Um, however, there are actually, and that's, that's one of the classes that I sailed in, there are classes of, of competition that you can actually uh, participate in as with a cruising boat, with uh, your normal leisure type craft, which makes it really very accessible. And then beyond that, you have people that really are hardcore racers that, that spend quite some effort, quite some money on the right equipment where very similar to automotive, automotive racing is it, the, the, lighter, the lighter the boat gets, the more expensive it gets. So it's kind of funny that there's less stuff on the boat and it's still more expensive. But... Uh, and then, then you end up in a situation like America's Cup, where you have more or less a big corporation buying the cup. But that's, that's a different, different situation. So what kind of training do you need to get involved with sailing? I mean, you talked about having something smaller. How do you learn how to sail? How, what, kind of, what kind of ways can you, other than just going out on ICs, I imagine there's some kind of progression there in terms of training. Right. It, actually, it, and the, easiest, the easiest way to do it is more or less like either that you learn it with a friend. You have somebody who has a boat, whether it's a small boat, larger boat, doesn't really matter that much, and can show you uh, sort of the basics. Um, I know people um, that just got a boat some, somehow and then started to sail. And actually, I just talked with somebody who did that. And the experience for that person and her daughter, who was part of that experiment, was not necessarily the most um, satisfying. Um, there is some fairly um, uh, fundamental technical knowledge that you have to have to do this safely. Actually, it's not, not really a big problem to shove a small boat out, out on a great lake get a uh, get a sail up and start start sailing the point is you want to know where you are you want to know what you do when you encounter other boats you want to be able to get back no matter from where the wind comes so there is some technical knowledge that you need to know um, as I said with a friend that might be a good idea but that takes you only so far as the friend knows and um, it, you might you might want to go into different directions as a as a complete beginner that hasn't got a um, an opportunity to sail with somebody else. Um, there are actually sailing clubs or yacht clubs that have really interesting beginners programs. So the DYC Detroit Yacht Club that I sailed with for a while has a Flying Scots program for beginners that is actually inexpensive, very accessible at a really at a really very nice nice pace where over a season people start sailing with Flying Scott, it's a sort of a very small, very manageable boat under supervision with, with good teachers and then more or less um, work themselves up to be able to 
helm and control a boat by themselves and at the end of the season they are, in, they are very safely in a position to manage a boat. Something similar like that is usually available with all good yachting sailing clubs. The North Cape Yacht Club in Toledo has a program like that um, and there are other, uh, other clubs that do that. Another thing that actually um, I found for myself very helpful, despite the fact that I knew the basics of sailing and never had really sailed a keelboat before. And I wanted to be able to charter boats on my own. So I went through, um, and I think, three classes that the American Sailing Association uh, licenses uh, that takes you from the basics of keelboat sailing over a sort of um, um, coastal navigation into being able to to uh, master a boat as a as a bear as a bear boat charter. And my my point of view would be uh, as much as it might be fun to go just out there and do something, I would not feel comfortable with that. Yes, the, it's a little more challenging, I think, than people might might first th might first encounter. So with that. Do you need some kind of credentials or licensing? I mean, you are operating a boat, although there's no, well, there usually is, I guess, no motor. Is there any kind of credentials that you need to do that? Or? Actually, all, all sort of keel, keel boats to mostly have, have some, some auxiliary engine, either diesel or an outboarder. But uh, one of the very interesting differences between the United States of America and Germany, where I grew up, is that in Germany, you have to have a driver's license for almost everything, and boats are no exception to that. And they are actually fairly difficult to come by. They are expensive in terms of the training. The, the, uh, the exam is very rigid, um, very tough, and it takes you usually from starting point, if you don't really have a lot of, a lot of uh, ingoing knowledge, to the point in time that you graduate at least a good year. For wow. um, for just the basic the basic driver's license, depending mm -hmm. on where you want to sail or or, or master a boat, uh, you have to have additional licenses mm -hmm. for that. So if you want to be co if you want to do coastal sailing, you have to have a coastal license. Mm -hmm. um, I I really appreciate that the the uh, situation here, where if you feel if you feel um, capable to do that, you can do that. Now, insurances. Mm. usually are looking for some sort of a, um, um, a proof of qualification. So the fact that I did these three classes that I talked about um, helped me with the insurance premium for my boat. So, but it's not, it's not required. If you don't, and, and I believe if you, don't, um, if you don't master a boat for commercial purposes here, you don't need to have um, a license for that. So speaking of that, in terms of having your own boat, I can imagine the costs of these must be on the more expensive side from a hobby perspective. Can, even if you don't know prices, can you give me an idea of, okay, the smaller boats and the boats get larger? It, and it really depends. Um, so I'm, by nature, I'm cheap. So it's not really it's not really uh, enormously expensive. The, the 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 easiest and most cost efficient way to get to a boat uh, and and sail is really uh, a beach cat or a small dinghy like a sunflower or something like that that you more or less can transport on uh, the top of your car. You sort of mm -hmm. launch it launch it on a lake or launch it at a at a beach. Uh, and sail with it. Perfect, perfectly okay. You can do that for something like 1500 bucks mm -hmm. and you sail. Uh, you don't really have a lot of creature comforts. Um, things like you, you might want to have, uh, you might want to have something to eat or to drink or uh, you might want to have other comforts. You, you won't find that. Um, if you go into larger boats like keel boats, like, like boats that have a cabin, then you have to count. You have to account for uh, marina fees. You have to account for fuel. Usually, um, launching and hauling the boat costs money. Um, I still find, compared to Germany or the European situation, it it is a it is a, a reasonably reasonably um, 
inexpensive uh, proposition here. The, the, the overall cost of managing, maintaining a boat here in the, in the, uh, along the Great Lakes is significantly cheaper than anything that I ever imagined in, in Germany. Well, that's good news for <laughs> hobbyists who might want to be interested in it. So, how can people get more information around sailing? So, if someone's interested in learning about sailing, that, how would you recommend, what kind of resources would you point them to? How would you recommend they kind of get started? So there is, there is the American Sailing Association, which has a website which is very, very useful and very helpful. There are local clubs. I mentioned to the Detroit Yard Club, North Cape, Bayview. Uh, there are marinas where uh, sailors are usually people that seem to uh, like company, that like to talk about their their hobby, so it's perfectly okay to just walk to somebody up uh, in a friendly way and start start a conversation. Um, has, ha has happened to me several times. Um, there, there are some there are some programs that I find really interesting. the The University of Michigan has a beginner sailing program, which is really a very interesting proposition. It is self paced. Um, it is. Um, very inexpensive. I think there's really only a nominal fee. It's uh, on. The, I think the, the the facilities that they use are on Baseline Lake, which is just a little bit west of of Ann Arbor. Uh, they have uh, Saturday classes for people. It's it's a very informal way of doing it. You show up. Uh, you you talk about with the uh, with the uh, with the staff and with the team there about what you want to do. You uh, get get cl get lessons, can sail on baseline lake. Very very nice program. Um, that that would be something if one somebody just wants to so get an idea that I would say might be very interesting. Another thing that that I find interesting is just being a spectator at one of the one of the races. So there's a um, actually any major club has some sort of a um, a Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday night beer can race, which is usually cruising boats that mm, compete for fun. There's usually some social aspect to that. That's that's always interesting to watch. Uh, a Port Huron Mackinac, clearly something that one can look at, and there's a lot of a lot of activity both in Port Huron and along the coast up to up to Mackinac, where people. Uh, around sailing are available. So there's a lot of things that, that, that you can do now. So what do you like the most about sailing? What, what drives you to go out on the high seas? And, and if we have time, could you explain to me how you sail against the wind? Because <laughs> I, I see it, but I don't really understand it. Um, it will be difficult to explain that without having a model and with a lot of without a lot of uh, talking well, with we'll, my we'll hands. Skip, but, we'll skip that. But <laughs> it, I, I can I can what, try. What, what excites what, you about? Let's go back to what's ex, what what is it, what is it that excites you most about sailing? Sail, is sailing is one of these things where um, th there is a technical challenge. And this is just my own, own level of interest in, in things. There is a technical challenge, so there is it's something that you need to know about about a little bit in order to even start it. It's something where you can both apply your brain and your muscle. Uh, it's something that um, has a little bit of possible competition, but is really not forcing you to do that. Um, and compared to power boating, you do something. There is not, there's, even if you're cruising, uh, most sailors will say that there's always something that they're looking at, want to adjust, want to trim this way or that way. So while, while it doesn't consume your entire, your entire um, focus, it's still something that can be done. If you are a power boater, and I'm not bad mouthing any power boaters by no standard, it's a relatively straightforward, straightforward exercise, and there isn't really, besides docking and undocking, a lot of really technical challenge in there. So that that's what 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 I find interesting, and then the idea of of operating with a power source that is just there and does what it wants, and you really don't have any control over that, is something that I find interesting. 
Yeah, it doesn't sound very relaxing. <laughs> it, it depends on what, what, and really it depends on the situation that, that, that you're in. My, my wife and I usually sail together and she's not really into fast sailing. She's not really s into sailing at higher wind conditions or b above 15 miles per hour wind. She doesn't, she isn't really comfortable. So what we usually do together is we sail in circumstances that are comfortable for her and that are usually not very challenging. Now, if I sail with friends, then we do different things. And um, we sail uh, usually a little bit faster, usually in wind conditions that are a little bit higher. So it's it's a different it's a different situation. But you can you, to a large extent if you plan if you plan well you can really pick it. Hmm. Well, when you're when you're sailing with a group of people, how how do you what how many do you have and how do you make sure you don't sort of run into each other, I guess, but still stay together? How, do, how does that work? Um, with m several people, se several crew on the boat? Well, several boats in the water. Are um, you talking about several boats or several people on the same boat? So several be people on the same boat can actually far more, can be far more dangerous <laughs> okay. than with several boats in the water. No, they're, they're actually the rules of the road. Another good reason to at least take one class to understand what the rules of the road are when you are racing and then that's uh, maybe the picture that you have in your mind where you have something like 25 boats lined up in about 100 yards of starting line or so and all are moving it's a it's a very interesting situation the most interesting situation in the race actually and there are rules of the road there are um, rules as to who has the right of way in what situation depending on the wind depending on where you're going where you're coming from um, that actually, that actually in normal situation, a non-competitive situation, is really not a big problem. Assuming the other person knows those rules, it's which is not, <laughs> which in Germany they might, in the United States they might. You, you can't, you can't rely on it. But um, I have seen, besides one exception, I haven't really seen any situation where I had to do very unnatural things because somebody else really wasn't no, really didn't know what they were doing. Well, can you kind of see that ahead of time if you're looking at someone and sort of tell, well, that person's not following rule number one, so maybe they're not going to follow the rest of them, so I need to do something different? Yeah, actually, this situation was a powerboater that obviously hadn't heard about the fact that sailboats have the right-of-way. Mm. Uh, so I had to do some strange things there, but you, you, you're absolutely right. You can anticipate something like that, and you can see if somebody is not attentive to the situation. So the situation that I was thinking about was somebody who obviously was not looking ahead, but was traveling at quite some speed and was on a collision course with my sailboat. Um, we, I don't have a ship's horn that I could use to, that I could use to alert that person. It, it would be unlikely if the person could have heard me in the first place with the engines blazing. So I had to tack relatively quickly and uh, relatively roughly in order to get out of his way. It's to be still were hit by, by his wake, which is not really a very comfortable situation. And there was language un at the end involved that was really not very printable, but what can you do? Mm -hmm. So back to the sailing question about sailing against the wind. Can, can you give me at least some idea of what that technique is like? Because it looks pretty challenging. You, you actually do not sail right into the wind. It's, it's, it's physically impossible to sail right into the wind. But depending on how your, how your boat is laid out, uh, and actually there's a difference between uh, monohulls and multi-hulls as well, depending on your boat, how your boat is laid out, you can sail up to about 30 degrees off the wind. Mm -hmm. um, the way of how this works is that specifically with with keel boats, you have a lot of lateral area. So mm -hmm. you dra the the the, um, the the drag that you have uh, going straight through the water is significantly lower than the drag that you would have if the if you would push the boat sideways, mm -hmm. which means that any force any force that is that is um, coming from from the side pushes you a little bit sideways but still quite significantly mm. forward so that's one part that works the other thing is people believe that the sails actually only propel you 
if the sails, if the wind hits the, the, the sails right from the back. That's actually not the case because the sails have, uh, the sails have um, a shape that is, if you look at it, very similar to um, the, the wings of an airplane. So you create a pressure system that actually uh, mm -hmm. sucks you forward and pushes you, pushes you from, from the bank. Mm -hmm. Specifically, if you have two sails, like a normal sloop would, ha would have uh, a foresail and a mainsail, then these two sails, if they are trimmed correctly, actually reinforce each other and create a stream that then pushes even further. So there is, that, again, one of these reasons, one of these reasons why I like sailing, there is some physics involved, uh, but it's not just all physics, it's not entirely predictable, and you have the situation that you, that you sail your boat and you make sort of minute adjustments to the trim and then wait for, does it make me faster, does it make me slower? And so there's, there's always something to do. You sort of, it, it seems like most hobbies have this effect of requiring, not only, not only does it relax people or, or it lets people enjoy themselves, there seems to always be some, some level of expertise involved that for whatever reason engages that person and really, really feeds them to keep pursuing that particular avenue, like you said, in sailing. Right. You talked about not liking other parts of, uh, maybe the powerboat people are not necessarily in favor, I guess, with you. Is there, is there, is it fair to say there's a, somewhat of a rivalry between the, the sailing community and the, and the, or sort of the organic power community and the human created power community? Is there any kind of dynamic going on there? I'm, I, there clearly is a dynamic. I'm, I don't, I, I think a, a lot of people, a lot of, it, and it's one of these, it's one of these rivalries like Ohio State and Michigan. While we couldn't have fun if we would, wouldn't play each other, there is still some sort of a tension in there. And that tension, is, I think, is there at least between uh, power boaters and sailors as well. I don't think there is animosity or anything like that, but we look at each other and say, yeah, that might be nice, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> right? and actually, and actually, I think it's a, vice, it's a vice versa type of effect. So are they, you have any nicknames for each other? <laughs> or anything you could say? Uh, uh, I think a perfectly printable is stink pot for a power boat. Oh, really? So, so the sailing people call call the power boaters a stink pot. Stink pot. What, where does that come from? Do you know? I, because there is always exhaust fumes <laughs> <That's true. laughs> that we don't produce, right? What did they call you? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody has called me anything to my face yet. <laughs> well, that's interesting. That's uh, yeah. I I find it that. It, you have, I don't want to call it a cult, but you have this sort of following within the, that, whatever particular community like the sailing community is. And there's always seemed to be an opposite, equal and opposite community, somewhat parallel, mm -hmm. but there's this kind of sideways looking at each other going, yeah, I, I see what you're doing, but what I'm doing is better. You know? I, I think that's, that's sort of the, 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 the nucleus of it, yeah. So if, if people, if someone wanted to go sailing, would you recommend they get a group of friends that maybe want to learn to do sailing and get someone to train them? Or is it, are there mechanisms where I myself can just go and get, get the training by myself, sort of, to speak? It really depends. It depends on, so the, the, the best way to have a boat is to have a friend who has a boat. So if you if you have that situation, you are lucky. You don't really have the expense. You don't have you don't have the hassle. You might want to help and work a little bit, but that's that's it. It really depends on where you are and what your interests are. Um, I, I I really believe that sort of starting with a group of people, and that might not be just your friends, but a club or somebody, a, a school. Uh, sailing school or something like that is a re is a really good starting point. The best way to try it out is do that because you can always say, okay, well, that that was nice, but really wasn't my thing. I rather have my uh, 1500 horsepower cigarette boat and do a poker run on the Detroit River or something like that, and that's perfectly okay. Yes, because you could make an investment in it and realize, right. well, maybe this isn't for me or right. something like that. Right. So finding someone. Right 
perhaps is into it, they, who's already been, been doing it for a while, engage them, and then try to kind of work your way through whether or not you're going to stay in it, and in what direction you're going to go, how much money you're going to spend, things like that. Right. So. And there's a saying that says the first boat that you buy is always the wrong boat. So. <laughs> it seems like that's a lot, there's a lot of sayings like that. But I can see the, the, the good thing is when you do make that purchase, at some point in time, if you realize it's the wrong boat, you know you've grown. That's a, that's a good way of looking at it and then plunking down another fairly large <laughs> amount of money for the right boat. Which is probably going to be considerably more expensive, but, but considerably more enjoyable. Hopefully well. so. So do you, do you own just one boat or do you have a, a, fl a little small <laughs> fleet? or what is, what, is your what does your wife allow you to do? Um, I have a 28.5 Hunter. It's a Hunter. Hunter is the, the brand of the boat, 28.5 foot long. It's, as I said, I'm cheap. It, it, it was built in 1987, mm. so it's quite a little bit an older boat. It's relatively well maintained. Um, and I uh, bought that with the permission of my wife, but on my own nickel, mm, okay. <laughs> which makes it, uh, makes it a, little bit, a little bit easier. Um, it's, it's actually, I have to say, as a, as a, as a, I bought it in 2000, four or five, four. Uh, and it was a good boat to start with. It was a good boat to start looking around in the Great Lakes and, and sailing on Lake Huron and later on on Lake Erie. By now, as I said, I'm more interested in rather than going stable, go faster. So mm -hmm. I, see, I see a new boat somewhere in my future, hopefully relatively soon. But that, again, will be only with the permission of, of, of my wife. All right. Well, I think we're about out of time. I'd like to thank Martin Wolfert for joining us and talking about sailing. Thank you. And please join us again for our next episode of Exploring Hobbies. Mm -hmm.